I S U P K. You done heard a thousand times before that there's no history of the Israelites ever being in Egypt, right? What if I told you that I found the city of the Hebrews in Egypt hidden in plain sight? And I'm going to bring it out at the Passover. This Passover 2016. I'm going to drop the day work. And tonight, to start the class, we're going to go into some history that is important information that everybody should know. If you're the type of brother that's into studying and understanding history and events in the past that have helped shape the world that we live in, to, live in today, what we're going to go into tonight is a very topic, is a very necessary topic to understand where we are in today's society when it comes to the drug epidemic the mass incarceration of black men, so-called white man going and fighting wars in all these other countries, invading everybody's country. You understand? All of the problem, not all of the problems, but a lot of the problems that we're dealing with today when it comes to drugs and mass incarceration goes back to really what started with the Ronald Reagan administration in 1980. You understand? We're gonna go into the Iran-Contra scandal tonight. Mm -hmm and get an understanding of what happened in the Iran-Contra scandal and how it, how it affected the Black, Hispanic, and Native Indian community here in America and the world all around, all right? Um, everybody knows that on March 6th, uh, Nancy Reagan passed away. Uh, Nancy Reagan was the devil that was married to Ronald Reagan. She was an actress back in the 50s and the 60s in the 80s, Ronald Reagan became president, all right? Nancy Reagan was, is well known by a lot of people. If you were 80s, baby, you on that 90s, baby, you got the uh, Just Say No to Drugs campaign. But if you were 80s, baby, on up, you remember when Nancy Reagan was telling everybody to just say no to drugs. If you was in public school, you remember once a year they had the firefighters and the police come through. They put on a little assembly and have everybody you know, learn to just say no to drugs. You understand that somebody try to pass you some weed, you say no. They try to sell you some crack, you say no, all right? But Nancy Reagan died and now is a good time to review what her legacy is because while she was saying just say no to drugs, her husband and the government of the United States of America was flooding the black, Hispanic, and Native Indian community with crack like you would never imagine, all right? Uh, all the brothers and sisters that's online, Hold your questions and get, make sure you check in on the Zoho chat. Uh, if you want a uh, blog talk, you got a question, make sure you press the number one so that the brother that's man in the computer knows that you have a question or a comment. <clears throat> I'm going to run through this history. First, we're going to go through the history, the public knowledge of the Iran-Contra scan. Then we're going to deal with what was really going on behind the scenes that the white man does not want to admit to today. You understand? With every, like they say, there's two sides to every story. Well, when you're dealing with world history, when you're dealing with politics, the Bible is the only place where you get the complete story. The Bible is the only place where you have an unbiased perspective of what happened in history. Everywhere else, history is written by the people who won. History is written by the people that are in charge, that want you to believe whatever they shape history to be. You understand? So when we look at history, especially dealing with anything that America is involved in, you have to look at both sides of the coin. You have to look at what America says happened, and then you got to see what really happened. You understand? So we're going to deal with both sides of the Iran-Contra scandal tonight. We're going to go into the scriptures and show you what the Bible says about drug dealing, about trusting the white man, you understand, and about getting out of the hell that we in today because of evil that the white man has been doing for 400 years, all right? So first, before we can understand what the Iran-Contra scandal is, we have to understand the Cold War. You understand? After World War II, which ended in 1944, 45, the world, the earth became split between two forces. 
Those two forces was America and Russia. Why were America and Russia the main superpowers on the earth? Because those were the two countries that really remained unaffected by World War II. During World War II, America was not attacked, the mainland of America. Yeah, the J Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, but there was no bombs dropped on Los Angeles, New York City, Washington, D.C. Nowhere on the mainland of America did World War II affect the people or the infrastructure. In Russia, the Germans had somewhat crossed Russian borders, but they were not able to get to Moscow. They were not able to destroy the main government hub of Russia. So after World War II, while Germany was destroyed, France was destroyed, Great Britain was destroyed, you understand, um, all them countries in between, Switzerland, Poland, Denmark, all of those countries, Italy, you understand, um, North Africa, everywhere that World War II was fought was decimated. So America and Russia were the main two powers. Along with America and Russia being the main two powers, you got two ideologies or two political systems that forced other countries to choose a side. The Russians were communists. A communist form of government means everything is uh, uh, communism or socialism is a type of government where everything is centralized around one leader, centralized around a figurehead that decides everything for everyone else. And under communism, the idea is that everybody gets an equal share. You a doctor, you a farmer, you a lawyer, you understand, you a, you a electronics man, you a cat that build missiles, you a soldier in the army, you're supposed to get the same pay all across the board. The problem with communism, the way that the white man has tried to institute it on the earth, is men are crooked and corrupt. So in communism, you always get the cat at the top making a ton of money and whoever's down with him and everybody else suffering. But that, is, that was the ideology of Russia, of the communists after World War II. Of course, in America, you had so-called democracy or the republic form of government where people choose their leaders and though that group of leaders decides what's best for everybody else. Along with democracy, you get the system of capitalism. Capitalism is an is a, is a economic system where supply, I mean, demand drives supply. You understand? In capitalism, the way that you make money is by having something that everybody wants. For example, everybody wants bottled water. And if I'm a manufacturer of bottles, plastic bottles, and everybody wants to drink their water out of plastic bottles and not out of fountains or out of the sink, then I can drive up the price of water bottles because everybody wants them. I can control the price of plastic. I say, well, plastic is $10 a bottle, 10 cents a, a bottle a day. I see the, the demand goes up. Everybody wants plastic bottles. I can come back in a month and say, well, you know, the price of bottles ain't gone up. It ain't 10 cents no more now. It's a dollar. Now I'm getting 10, I'm getting 100% more what I was getting a week ago off these plastic bottles. So guess what? My company's stocks is going to skyrocket. You understand? Now, of course, in a capitalist system, if you have the main control over anything that the people demand, then you're going to get rich. You understand? And that's why America sometimes is called a free market system. But of course, the market isn't really free because the white man controls everything. You ain't getting paid in capitalism unless you work for the people who are making investments. Everybody understand. But that was the split in the earth after 1945 and World War II. Either you were capitalist and, 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 and had a democracy or you were communist and you were down with the ideology of socialism. Everybody understand? Every war that was fought after World War II was really a war between America and Russia, the Korean War. The Russians was dealing with the North Koreans, they became communists. They social centralized the government, they took control of all the oil, all of the, the, the weapon manufacturers, all of the rice fields, the government took control. The government decided how much rice was gonna cost, how much we shipping and where we shipping it to. South Korea became a democracy. They had the capitalist system where the people that were in charge or had money could take loans from the banks. The people with the money could be able to divvy it out to other people, hire workers to work in their factories. They could drive their businesses and make money. Everybody understand? Uh, the Vietnam War, you understand? The Viet Cong were the communists. They decided to join up with Russia. They took every government, took control of everything. There was no private owned businesses. 
You understand? America came in and got with South Korea. I believe it was North Korea. America was in that Korea. Vietnam. America got with North Vietnam. The Russians controlled South Vietnam. Boom, there was a Vietnam War. Well, around 19, in the 1970s, right? Late 1960s, 1970s, that civil war started to spill over into the Western Hemisphere, over here in South America. You had the Cuban Missile Crisis with um, John F. Kennedy. You had the Cubans take, uh, what's the cat name? Ah, uh, cat in Cuba. Um, not, not Che Guerrero. Not Che Guerrero. The other one that was with Che Guerrero. Sorry. Come on. Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro sided with the Russians. Fidel Castro, when they took over Cuba, he kicked out all of the American businessmen. Because when you take when the, the another aspect of the communist government means the government takes over all the businesses. So there are no private investors. There are no private contractors. Well, when Fidel Castro took over Cuba, he kicked out all of the American businesses. All the American businessmen, all the bankers, they had to leave. That is when you had the flood of Cubans coming into Miami and Florida. That's why you go down to Florida now, there's a lot of old white people. A lot of them old white people that speak Spanish came from Cuba. They were Edomites that were living in Cuba, running all the banks. When, for them, when, they, when the Cubans took their country back, they kicked out all of the white American supporters. You understand? Well, after Fidel Castro took over Cuba, America struck back by trying to assassinate him. That's when you had the Bay of Pigs incident where the Russians put missiles in Cuba, aimed them at America. John F. Kennedy had to squash the whole thing, and America left Cuba alone. Well, after Cuba failed to communism, there was the threat of other countries falling to communism. And in 1979, you had a government overthrow in the country of Nicaragua. Nicaragua is a country in South America for a long time, the Nicaraguan had the Nicaraguans had a a monarchy or a king system for their government. The king's name was um. Give me one second. The family that was ruling in Cuba were committing atrocities against the people because they started to stand up and want want their rights. They wanted to be heard and have a voice. So, in order to and in essence, a revolution started in Nicaragua. And on the side of the revolutionaries was a group known as the Sandinistas or the Sandinista National Liberation Front. The Sandinistas had the mindset of communists. They wanted to take back their country, get rid of the American influence, get rid of all of the American bankers, get rid of all the American businessmen. They wanted to take their country back and give it back to the people. They wanted to take back the resources that coming out of all of the countries in South America, North, uh, the United States of America was getting imports, imports of pot, uh, of um, chocolate, you understand, uh, sugar cane, rum, oil, silver, zinc, all of the different metals and minerals that America needed to function and be industrialized, they were getting from South America. When the Sandinistas took over their country, they kicked all the white business interests out and said, man, we're taking our country back for the people. Under the Sandinista government, literacy, literacy started to thrive, meaning they was making sure the people were educated, make sure everybody learned and understood how the world worked and understood politics and understood, you know, mathematics and, 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 and how to, you know, be a functioning society. They basically industrialized themselves. Well, again, the white man started to lose money. You put him out and don't allow his business to thrive, then he's gonna retaliate, all right? Before we get to retaliation, also in 1930, 1979, on the other side of the world, in the Middle East, this man, whose name was the, he was known as the Shah in Iran. In 1979, Iran had a revolution. And in the Iranian revolution, they kicked out the Shah. The Shah ruled from 1953 to 1979. And he was the monarch or the king, the emperor over the Persian peoples. Iran, if you don't know, is ancient Persia. You understand? Persia in the Bible is Iran today. You understand? From the time of Cyrus the Great, all the way back in 550-something B.C., up until the Shah in 1979, Iran was ruled by an emperor. You understand? Iran was ruled by a king. 
which everybody recognizes authority and his rulership over the people. The problem with the Shah is that he was Americanized or Westernized. They called him a secular ruler. Now, what do we know about the land over there in the Middle East? What is the religion or the belief of everybody over there? Uh, Islam. They Islam. They Muslims, right? In Islam, there's certain things you have to do, a way you must conduct yourself in order to be accepted by the religious people, right? This man was not religious. You see, he got a shaved face. He ain't got that Muslim beard. You understand? You see, he decked out with all of the war medals like an American soldier. You understand? When they say that the Shah was secular, what they mean is he got high and drank and had parties and loved white people. And in Iran, the, um, he, he wanted to industrialize Iran. So he had, of course, white businessmen over there, you know what I'm saying, white architects, white engineers, white bankers, loaning the country money, you understand, being buddy-buddy with him, the oil fields, he was letting white businesses invest in the oil fields. Well, in 1979, there was a revolution and the people of Iran wanted this man out. You understand? The leader of that revolution was this man. He's known as the Ayatollah, you understand? Or his 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 uh Arabic name is Ruhala Khomeini, you understand? Now, this man was a staunch Muslim. You see he got the beard. You see he got the turban on his head. This was a Muslim that was serious about Islam. He was serious about the woman covering themselves, serious about not smoking and not being a drunkard. He was serious about the white man being an infidel and being his enemy. You understand? And he um, organized the Islamic Republic of Iran. They kicked out the Shah. The Shah fled with all his American interests. He fled to Egypt. America supported him coming out of there because America didn't want beef with these cats. You understand? But Ayatollah ruled in in iran for quite some years but he's the reason he was the revolutionary that got iran to be staunch islam he brought back sharia law he brought back cutting a cat arm off for stealing stoning a woman to death for being an adulteress or for showing the back of her neck or her ankles you understand they brought they ushered in the call for all muslims to come back to being serious about following the quran and doing what muhammad stated he was also, he's a Shia Muslim, you understand? The Shia Muslims are the staunch Muslims. They're the ones that, they don't play no games. Different from the Shiites, who are a little bit more lenient when it comes to the infidels and killing the enemies, you understand? The Shias are the ones that are serious about that law. The Shiites is a little laxed, everybody understand? The Shiites are the ones that do business, you know what I'm saying, with the white man, shave their beard, come over here, put on a suit. But the Shias are the ones that put that turban on, get that beard. They over there in Dubai wrapped up in them, them white garments. Everybody understand? Oh, God. So with, the, with Iran taking back their country, it shut the white man out of business over there in the Middle East, right? So in 79, you had a revolution in Nicaragua, which kicked out American interests. You had a revolution in Iran, which kicked out, of, kicked out American interests. Well, in 1980, this man became president of the United States of America. This is Ronald Reagan. When Ronald Reagan became the president, <laughs> Ronald Reagan's vice president was this man, George Herbert Walker Bush. Now, in night, from the 1960s through the 70s, George Herbert Walker Bush was a senator in the United States Congress. But he also was a businessman who had started an oil company. In 1977, George Herbert Walker Bush became the director of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency for America. The job of the CIA was to spy on everybody all across the earth and make sure that America's power stayed in power. The CIA was behind all of the Cold War activities after World War II. You understand? When, when Korea started to have a war, CIA went over there and told South Korea, we got your back. When Vietnam jumped off, the CIA was over there supporting the North Vietnamese, saying, we got your back. You understand? With the Cuban Missile Crisis, the CIA were the ones that sent operatives in to assassinate 
Fidel Castro. Everybody understand? Well, in 1980, when Reagan became president, George Bush was the vice president. And it was the CIA that infiltrated in Nicaragua to form a rebel group to fight against the newly formed Sandinista government. Everybody understand? When the people of Nicaragua got a government that was for the people, that was for using the resources to help better the nation and benefit the people, the CIA created a counter group to fight against that government. Everybody understand? That counter group was known as the Contras. You understand? The CIA formulated the Contras to fight against the Sandinistas so that American interests could continue to get the business done that they wanted to get done in Nicaragua. Another thing that I left out, okay, not I left out, but when the revolution started in Nicaragua and the Sandinistas kicked out the rulership that was there, all of the military generals, all of the businessmen left as well. But one of the major exports out of Nicaragua was cocaine or coca, you understand? When all of those rich men that was getting paid under the government that existed had to leave after the revolution, they came to America and brought their drugs to America with them. You go back and look at movies like Blow, um, movies like uh, Scarface. When them Cubans came to America, with the Cuban situation, the Nicaraguan situation, when they came to America, they brought all their drugs with them. And powder cocaine flourished in America from the late 60s through the 70s. You understand? But around the time of the when 1980 came, the cocaine traffic sort of slowed down. You understand? And that also was a problem for the white man. So in supporting the Contras, the CIA was also supporting the drug dealers that were in Nicaragua. Everybody understand? So in 1980, Reagan was elected president. George, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was the vice president. Herbert Walker Bush worked in the CIA from 77 to 78. After failed attempts to bribe the Sandinista and to get them to change their government policy, they tried to bribe the Sandinistas. Listen, man, y'all took over the government. Y'all want to give everything back to the people we understand. We'll give you aid. America and Ronald Reagan was giving aid to the Sandinistas to help them get on their feet, get the government back and running. You understand? The Sandinistas took the aid but refused to change their stance on not allowing American businesses in, not, you know what I'm saying, um, making sure the resources went back to the people. So after a while, Reagan got tired. He cut off all the aid that he was given to the people of Nicaragua. When he cut off the aid, then Russia came in. The Soviets came in and said, listen, man, we got y'all back. The Soviets teamed up with the Sandinistas and was became their support system. When the Sandinistas needed guns, the Soviets gave it to them. Russia gave it to them. Sandinistas needed money, the Russians gave it to them. Sandinistas needed to sell goods out of their country, Russia came and brought all of their goods. Everybody understand? So on one side, Russia is supporting the Sandinistas. On the other side, America and the CIA has created the Contras, all right? In 1982, the Reagan, Reagan made the platform of his presidency to be supporting the democratization of nations everywhere. Reagan came out in 82 and said, listen, man, we cannot allow communism to take over. We cannot allow communism to topple South America because that's right in our backyard. If communism takes over South America, then we here, we fuck. You understand? Excuse my French. So Reagan made it public, went to Congress and got money to help him to stop communism from spreading all around the world. A part of stopping communism from spreading was to stop the Sandinistas down in, um, in, in, in Nicaragua. It was to stop what was going on in Panama. You understand? It was to stop what was going on to further support the camp, to further support uh, South Korea or to further support the Koreans, further support the Cambodians. They also were doing business deals with the Saudi Arabians. You understand? The Saudi Arabians brokered in oil deals with America. When they promised to give their oil to America, if America promised to just leave them the hell alone. You understand? Again, George Herbert Walker Bush, the vice president at this time, owned a oil company. So who makes money off of doing business deals with the Saudi Arabians? America does. Everybody understand? Um, in 1980, now, 
1980, a war started between Iran and Iraq. It was known as the Iran-Iraq War, and it went on from 1980 to 1988. The Iran and Iraq War started because after the revolution in Iran, the leaders in Iraq were scared that the Shias was going to come and take over their government. At this time, the Iraqis had a good relationship with America. They, they were trying to industrialize themselves. The rulers in Iraq were doing the same thing that the Shah was doing in Iran. Once they saw that these Muslim heretics took control of Iran, they was like, we not have it. Iraq went and attacked Iran. America was supporting Iraq. America was training Iraq's troops. The Iraq, the Iran-Iraq war is how Saddam Hussein came into power. You understand? With America supporting the military and the government, that's what Saddam Hussein got all his training from America from. All of the weapons, all of the guns, all of the tanks, all of the airplanes that, that the Iraqis had to fight America in the Iraq war, the, America knew what they had because they supported them in the Iran-Iraq war. Everybody understand? So in the Iran-Iraq war, you had America supporting Iraq. You had Russia supporting Iran. Again, another civil war tie-in. Well, listen, in 1984, not even before that, in 79, before the Iranians took over their government, does everybody know about the Iranian hostage situation that happened during the Olympics? During the Olympics, I believe it was, I'm going to look it up right quick. During the Olympics, I want to say it was 79, I want to say it was 80. The Iran hostage crisis, right? <laughs> okay. The Iran hostage crisis was a diplomatic crisis between Iran and the U.S. More than 60 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage for 444 days from November 4, 1979 to January 20, 1981, after a group of Iranian students belonging to the Muslim student followers of the Imam's line who supported the Iranian revolution took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. So in 1979, during the revolution, the Iranians said to hell with that. They took over the American embassy, held 66 U.S. diplomats hostage for a year and a half, right? After this, when America eventually made a deal with these cats and was able to get their diplomats back, they didn't kill the diplomats, and America was like, boom. After that, America put in an embargo against Iran to stop other countries from trading with Iran, from selling them guns, selling them missiles, selling them helicopters. Well, who was the one country America couldn't stop from selling Iran anything? It was Russia. You understand? So after this, Iran learned a lesson. They were like, well, shit, if we take hostages, America do deals with us. So in 1984, the Iranians got real bold, and they kidnapped a CIA director who was operating out of Beirut, Lebanon. This CIA director's name was, um, oh, man. What is this? William Bunkley. In 84, Islamic jihadists kidnapped William Bunkley in Beirut, Lebanon. And over the years following 1984, they started kidnapping more American CIA agents, American business interests, bankers, cats that's trying to broker bank deals in the Middle East. The Iranians was like, fuck it, we just going to round them up. So they started kidnapping Americans. Now, I don't know how popular this was in the news in America because I wasn't born yet. But for the American government, it was a big deal because the message was being sent to other nations that you can just do whatever the hell you want to do to America. Everybody understand? Oh, my God. Well, the time, in order for the Americans to be able to get their hostages back, the Iranians said, you're going to have to give us some weapons. Your country then took a stance against us in the public, saying that y'all not going to let us get no weapons to help fight this. We fighting a war. Y'all going to stop other countries from trading with us? We're going to kidnap your people, wherever they may be. So America, under undercover, started to make deals with the Iranians to give them guns, give them missiles, give them, you know what I'm saying, rocket launchers, in order for the hostages to be released. America, America broke with these deals by going through um, Israel. You understand? The Israelis were selling the Iranians' weapons on behalf of the United States of America. Well, at the same time that all this was going on, America was losing the war in Nicaragua with the Contras. Because Russia was supporting the Sandinistas, the Contras could not get a stronghold in Nicaragua. 
So what America started to do in order to be able to fund the Contras was they were taking the money that they got from selling guns to the Iranians and they were taking that money and giving it to the Contras. Here's what they don't tell you. What the Contras gave America in return was cocaine. America gave the Contras, I mean, the Contras in Nicaragua gave the American CIA agents cocaine. The CIA agents took cocaine and flew it to California, where they sold it to drug dealers, where they sold it to the gangs that had been formed in Los Angeles, known as the Crips and the Bloods. So in exchange for drug money, the Nicaraguans got guns. The guns they got, I mean, they got money to buy guns. The guns they got, the money they got from the CIA agents came from the guns that America was selling to Iran. That is how Iran and the Contras got intertwined. The Contras never directly dealt with Iran. They on two sides of the earth. The Contras was fighting the civil war in Nicaragua. Iran was fighting the war against Iraq. But America was funding both sides because they were smuggling guns to the Iranians, even though in the public, America told no country to deal to have dealings with Iran. America was giving them guns so that they could get their hostages back. They get the hostages, give the guns, the money they got from giving the guns, they took and gave it to the Contras in Nicaragua. The Contras gave them cocaine, and with the money the Contras got from the cocaine, they brought guns from the Americans. Everybody understand? Oh, now, in 1985, um, in 1986, a U.S. plane was shot down. The plane was carrying supplies that were going to the Contras. Eugene Hassenfuss, which was a, I don't know if he was in the CIA or if he was a, I know he was American, right? He got captured. And him being captured broke the news that America was full out sending guns to the Contras in Nicaragua, right? In November of 86, the Lebanese news broke the story that the white that the americans was selling guns to iran and when the news story broke it was major new it was major because the, reagan had been telling the people of america we're not supporting terrorists we're not supporting this and that we're only supporting democracy you understand but the whole time they support they were paying terrorists in nicaragua to fight against their democratic government you understand why they're telling the people Iran doesn't have a democracy. Iran is an evil country. They were selling them guns to help them fight the war that they was fighting against Iraq. So when it came out, it made big news. You understand? It was um they had hearings on it, trials in it, right? In the trials, there was a man named Oliver North, right? This man here is Oliver North. Oliver North was a sergeant. In the, and he's a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Oliver North was the man that was in charge of making sure that the guns got to the Iranians and the money got to the Nicaraguans. He was the military man in charge working with the, with the CIA to help the guns get into North America. I mean, get the gun, the drugs from Nicaragua into North America. So when they put him on trial, and made him testify, he had to spill his guts about everything that was going on behind the scenes. And it was big, it was ugly, it was a mess. Now, it wasn't until later that the backside of this story came out. On the back now, the public story is Oliver North, working in the military for the CIA, was selling guns to Iran in order to get the hostages, taking the money from those gun deals with Iran, giving the money to the country. It never came out publicly that Oliver North was helping the Contras get cocaine into America. That didn't come out until a man named Gary Webb. You pull up a picture of Gary Webb. Gary Webb was a reporter with the, how was the name of the newspaper? Pull up a picture of Gary Webb. Gary Webb was a reporter for the San Jose Mercury News, right? Gary Webb broke a story called Dark Alliance, which broke, which exposed the ties between the Contras 
and the cocaine epidemic and the crack epidemic that started in California in 1980. Gary Webb broke the story that exposed how the CIA was helping the Contras bring cocaine into America in order for the Contras to get money to buy weapons. Everybody understand? Now, when this story broke, everybody said this man was a liar. Everybody said this man was making it up. But there were men who went to trial, like Freeway Ricky Ross. Anybody ever heard of Freeway Ricky Ross? Kind of Everybody heard of Rick, Rick Ross the rapper, right? Oh my God. Well, Rick Ross the rapper is the biggest fake nigga you ever seen in your life. <laughs> Rick Ross stole this man's identity. This man's name is Freeway Ricky Ross. Freeway Ricky Ross got rich in 1980 to about 84, selling all of the cocaine in California. Rick Ross was getting so much cocaine that he was making about $3 million a day. All right. They made a movie about Freeway Rick Ross, about Gary Webb. The name of the movie is Kill the Messenger. Now, in the now, everybody should understand that Hollywood is white man's propaganda, meaning Hollywood is where you tell the fantasy side of every story, right? Gary Webb, after he broke the story about the CIA bringing all the crack into America, they said there was so much pressure on him that Gary Webb committed suicide. Gary Webb was found dead with two bullets in his head. How you commit suicide and shoot yourself in the head twice? The official story on how Gary Webb died is that he blew his brains out. If you watch the movie, Kill the Messenger, it'll show you how Gary Webb did his investigation and got to the bottom of the CIA selling all the crack in California. Gary Webb, working with Rick Ross, was able to, Freeway, <laughs> Freeway Rick Ross was able to expose the story. Everybody understand? Oh, God. This man, Gary Webb, Gary Webb did a series of newspaper articles that he titled Dark Alliance. Later on in about 88, he wrote a book called The Dark Alliance. And in the book, he exposes all of the research that he did to make the ties between the Contras in South America, all the cocaine that was coming into California, and eventually the crack epidemic. Everybody understand? Now I'm going to play an excerpt from a video interview that Gary Webb did where he talks about his research and everything that he found. After this, we're going to go into the drug side of everything. We're going to go into how George Herbert Walker Bush, working for the CIA, had operatives in South America in the 70s studying the effects of crack cocaine, studying the effects that smoked cocaine had on people and how it destroyed communities and entire, you understand, villages in South America before it ever made its way to New York, to California, to Chicago. The crack epidemic started in South America because of the work of men like George Herbert Walker Bush, everybody understand? Oh, Real quick, here's, a, here's an excerpt from a video um, from Gary Webb explaining all the research that he found um, to show that the CIA was selling drugs. Real quick, Marat, oh, if I can get the cord. I need the cord so I can get the sound on here. Oh, all right. God. I just want everybody to pay attention. It's going to be about three or four minutes. I'm going to let it play. Then we're going to go get into the scriptures, all right? Oh, my God. Hand me that. The water. If everybody online, I'm gonna put this on the big screen so y'all can see it. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. He said that she knew exactly why Mark Dolenzi kept the dress. Did you want to explain it? Um, boy, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest is Gary Webb. He is the author of this book called Dark Alliance, the CIA, the Contras, and the Crack Cocaine Explosion. What led to this? I had been uh, working, covering the drug war for the Mercury News for a number of years, and um, this was an outgrowth of a story that I had done uh, about the state of California's asset forfeiture program, which is a program where if the police believed you were a drug dealer, they could come in and take your house and your car and your money. Uh, without even charging you with a crime. And I had been doing stories on that, and uh, a young lady in Oakland had read one of them and called me up and put me onto a story about her boyfriend, uh, who was a 
an accused cocaine trafficker who had that happen to him. He had his property taken away. Daniel Blade. Uh, his name was Rafael Cornejo. It turned out that uh, the key witness against him for the federal government was this fellow, uh, Daniel Blandon, who had been uh, a leader of the Contras in California in the early 1980s and had been. See, now Danilo Blandon was the man that was bringing all the crack in. He was the main Nicar he was the main Contra contact that was bringing all the dope into California. Danilo Bland uh, Blandino was being helped by the CIA. All of his plane trips back and forth was facilitated and supported by CIA operatives. A huge cocaine trafficker in his own right. And when I got into investigating her boyfriend's case, I came across uh, Blandone and I came across his involvement with the Contras and his involvement um, ultimately with a major crack wholesaler in Los Angeles and Freeway Ricky Ross. And so I did a series um, that, that said that the crack market in South Central Los Angeles had been created in the early 1980s with the help of this Contra drug ring and um, showed how. Once crack got hold in South Central, once the gangs got a hold of it, it was spread from South Central to other cities in the United States. And uh, it ended up being a huge controversy. You begin by talking about the Somoza family and the allegiance that the family in Nicaragua, the ruling family, had with the U.S. government for more than 40 years. And then you write that the Americans wanted him to disappear. What happened? Now, before, before the revolution in Nicaragua in 79, the Sandoval family was the leaders, but the Sandoval family had fell out with America because of their treatment of the people. They were treating the people bad, and the news started to talk about it. So it was America making America look bad. So America initially wanted this man to be removed out of power, but when the Sandinistas took control, they said, to hell with America, we're going to do what we want to do, which is why it created the need for America to fund the Contras. Well, he became an embarrassment to the American government. Um, his his army, the National Guard, was committing human rights abuses. And remember, this was during the Carter era, and human rights were big on our agenda at that time. And so they came to him and said, this has gotten out of hand. You need to step aside. We need somebody else to take over. And at that point, they were still trying to salvage the, the, the American government's relationship with, with Nicaragua. Uh, obviously, at that point, it was too late. And uh, the Sandinistas came in and threw everybody out. And what happened was a lot of the men close to Somoza, a lot of the men from his army came to the United States because we had been allies with them for a long time. And among this flood of, of political exiles were these two major cocaine traffickers who set up a drug ring along the West Coast and dealt tons of cocaine in the United States for many, many years while the U.S. government was aware of them. So connect the events that okay. began with this and then led to the series in the San Jose Mercury News and you read, read about Howard Kurtz in the Washington Post right. who you had a conversation with claiming that the Mercury News was trying to suppress the story or well, parts of the story? This was, this was afterwards, after the series came out, um, but my story and, and myself were attacked by the Washington Post and the New York Times and the LA Times um, for drawing conclusions that were unwarranted essentially. And um, after the counterattacks and the media started, uh, the Mercury News sent me back down to Central America. Uh, my partner, George Fidel, and I uh, wrote another series of stories um, that essentially took the knowledge of this drug ring even further in the United States government. The Mercury did not print those stories, and Howard Kurtz called me up, and I mentioned to him that there were additional stories that we had written that the Mercury News was suppressing, uh, and he did a call about it uh, in the Washington Post. And why did they suppress it? At that point, I mean, you know, they had been beaten up for about nine months uh, by the mainstream media. Uh, and at that point, the decision was made, either we go forward with this story and we get beaten up some more, or we back off of the story and, and it goes away. And what they decided to do was back off of it and go with it. And, you know, similar to what happened with the CNN tailwind story, uh, pursuing it would have created a huge controversy. Backing away from it created a minor controversy at the time, and now the story is gone. It's off the radar screen. So... Who's the Dark Alliance with? The, the Dark Alliance referred to the allegiance between the, these Contra drug traffickers and the, the gangs of Los Angeles, who were their main customers. And who are the Contras? The Contras were a, you know, former Somoza supporters, former Somoza military officers who were, had been kicked out of, of uh, Nicaragua in 1979 and were trying to retake the country with the aid of the CIA. 
And the one thing that's important, uh, and a lot of people don't, don't recall because this is ancient history, you know, it happened 15 years ago, um, was that the Contras were a creation of the CIA. And so when our story came out saying that the Contras uh, were dealing drugs in Los Angeles and elsewhere, and that the, these drug traffickers were meeting with CIA agents, uh, a lot of people took that to say the CIA created the crack epidemic, which I mean, is clearly not the case. I, I spent a great deal of time in the book talking about how crack was on its way uh, at the time this happened. But the, the, the impact of it was that when you had all this cheap cocaine going into South Central Los Angeles, right at the time people were figuring out how to take this powder cocaine and turn it into crack, you had sort of a, a collision of historical events in a very odd place. Um, and, and what happened from that was you had the spread of crack nationwide because the gangs spread nationwide. The gangs, after the L.A. market got saturated, took this to other cities and set up crack markets in other cities that didn't happen. What led to you to... All right, that's enough on that. So everybody understands the connections between the war in Nicaragua CIA and cocaine in California, right? Now, of course, Gary Webb is the devil. So even he's not going to go full out and say the CIA created crack. You understand? But I got some I got some research that proves without a shadow of a doubt that the CIA and the US government knew exactly what they were doing, allowing cocaine to come into California and then teaching the drug dealers to make crack cocaine. Now, I, we all men of the Lord changed our lives and we serve the Lord today. But there in our former lives, some of us may have known how to take powder cocaine and turn it into crack. And if you failed chemistry and biology, you ain't going to be able to turn powder cocaine into crack. You understand? It is a scientific chemical process that you must undertake in order to get powder cocaine into the rock crack form. Negroes in South Central LA in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, wasn't just doing chemistry experiments with powder cocaine. First of all, powder cocaine was expensive. White people used powder cocaine. The drug for black people was marijuana and, and heroin. Crack, I mean, powder cocaine was not a easily accessible drug for black people in, in the 70s, you understand, in the 80s. So to take powder cocaine and to turn it into crack was not the invention of a black man. And I'm going to give you some history proof on it. But before we get there, let me get Psalm chapter 55, verse 21. Also, if you go online on the ISUPK blog, there's a story that we put up yesterday called The Death of a Trap Queen, talking about Nancy Reagan and her cunt. Talking about Nancy Reagan and her legacy as a, you know, advocate for saying no to drugs. She had a whole say no campaign, but the whole time she was telling everybody to say no, her husband and the government was flooding the black community with crack. Psalms 55 and 21, you got it? Come on, come on. Come on with it. Psalms chapter 55, verse 20, 21. 21. Verse 21. I can, I got it. Come, go ahead. All right. Um, the words. Of his mouth were smoother than butter. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. Read on. But war was in his heart. The words of the white man has always been smooth towards us. You understand? Black people, we love you, give you civil rights. Just say no to drugs. But behind those words, they're flooding your community with cocaine, flooding your community with guns. You understand? Inciting gang violence, inciting beef, turf wars. You understand? The words of his mouth were smooth. Just say no. We're fighting the drug on war the whole time. The war exists because they're the ones that's bringing all the drugs over. His words are smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. Read on. His words were softer than oil. The words were softer than oil. Nice, soft, sweet, loving words. Read on. Yet, were they drunk, swart? But in reality, he was coming to cut your head off, coming to blow your brains out. You understand? In 1971, President Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs. He was the one that started the war on drugs. And in 71, Nixon said that America's public enemy number one in the U.S. 
was drug abuse. In 1973, Nixon created the Drug Enforcement Agency or the DEA. Nixon said that the DEA was to stop war, was to fight a war on drugs. You understand? But in reality, behind the scenes, the DIA was monitoring, regulating, and monopolizing the drug trade. Everybody understand? Give me Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. Now, what could have stopped the crack cocaine epidemic? What could have stopped the explosion and the detriment that crack did to entire three generations now of black people since 1980? These laws in this Bible would have stopped the crack epidemic. Laws in the Bible would have stopped the weed smoke. Everybody understand? Laws in the Bible is how you just say no. That's some campaign by Nancy Reagan. Read. Some. No, nah, Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 25. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. By the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a what? A way that seemeth right unto a man. By the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the ends there are are the ways of death. You understand? Read on. Verse 26. He that laboreth, laboreth for himself. He that what? Laboreth, laboreth for himself. He that laboreth. No, no. It's like it. Drop down from there. It's like it. Um, give me verse 27. It's, and there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some ways that seem right? Joining a white man. Joining the white man seems right, man. Becoming a police officer, getting in the military, going to go fight and be brave and stand for democracy seems like it's right. But in the end, all you get is death, man. Siding with the white man, you understand? Joining the DEA, joining the CIA task force to stop all of the drugs coming in seems like it's a good idea. Seems like it's something that's beautiful that can help us. But in reality, all you get is death. You understand? Being a Christian. Loving Jesus and God and everybody joining together and forgiving your enemies seems like a wonderful idea. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. But there's another way that men, it seems like it's right. Seems like it's a good thing, ain't no problem. But the end of it is death. Give me a uh, Proverbs 16 and 27. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. What? An ungodly man diggeth up evil. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. Read on. And his lips, there, there is as a burning fire. And what? And his lips, there is as a burning fire. Say it one more time. And. Start it from the top. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. And in his lips, there is as a burning fire. And in his lips, there is as a burning fire. Now, what does that look like? Everybody see this picture here, right? Mm -hmm. Who's that? Snoop Doggy Dog. What is Snoop Doggy Dog famous for? Smoking weed, right? Now, Snoop Dogg get high. Do we go kill people? Snoop Dogg get high. He go rob your grandmother. No, Snoop Dogg get high and it's fun, man. Chilling, partying, laid back, everything cool. Seems right to get high, right? Get high, man, and clear your mind, and you get you ain't so amped up no more. You get to forget about all the stress. You get to just chill. Get to just relax. You understand? There's a way that seemed right to a man. But the Lord said an ungodly man digs up evil. Where does weed come from? Okay, not on the earth where it comes from. Where do you get where you get marijuana from? Yana From the earth. From the earth. It's a plant that grows. You take that plant, pluck it up off the earth. Right now, is it ungodly to pluck a plant out the earth? Is it a sin to take marijuana out of the earth? No, no. So what is the ungodly thing? Marah. Smoking when you when between your lips is as a burning fire. Everybody understand? You put that marijuana between your lips, and it is as a burning fire between your lips. That's when you ungodly man. You take tobacco. Nothing wrong with tobacco, but when you take tobacco and put it between your lips and it's as a burning fire, then you become ungodly. You take coke. Now, where does cocaine come from? 
to find out who's ex dope boys in here. Sign up. <laughs> <laughs> where, where does cocaine come from? Uh, Tells you one. So like the, the, the coca leaf comes from the coca leaf, right? Yeah. Nothing wrong with the coca leaf. Coca leaf is the leaf, right? Yeah. But if you take the coca leaf and you crush it down and take take all of the, the damn um, secretions out of it and dry it out to become powder, and then you mix it with baking soda and I can't give you the whole rundown, <laughs> but you mix it with some stuff and cook it and put it between your lips, it becomes ungodly. Everybody understand. Yeah. But if our people would have known this, guess what we would have never did? Would have never put no crack pipe between our lips. Would have never put no marijuana between our lips. Would have never put no tobacco between our lips. Everybody understand? Just say no is to follow the Bible. Follow the law, statutes, and commandments. Everybody understand? But our people in the 70s and the 80s, man, they was not following the Bible. So guess what we did? We took the ungodly, we took the things out of the earth and did something ungodly with it. Put it between our lips and it was as a burning fire between our lips and that burning fire destroyed the black community we destroyed the black community crack destroyed the black community now while we were the ones that put it to our lips it's the white man's fault for bringing it over here everybody understand you understand the way of selling drugs and using them may seem right but the end of that path is death all of us has a story of somebody whose life has been affected by crack cocaine I don't care who you are, where you from, how rich or poor your family was, you know a crackhead. Or a crackhead was in your family. You had that one uncle that you couldn't let, you understand, be around. You understand? And this is what y'all got to understand. During the 70s, after the Civil Rights Movement, the 70s and the 80s was the height of black power. It was the height of black coming together and anti-America everything. And black people had amassed, we had gotten to a level where the white man was not going to be able to stop us. You understand? But y'all got to understand about the generation that came up, you understand, in, in the black community after World War II. After World War I, during World War II, the white man went to go fight, right? All of the white man's children went to go fight. Well, back home in America, there was a industrial boom to help the military get off the ground. They opened up factories. Car factories weren't making cars. They were making tanks. You understand? They, were, they weren't making uh, trains. They was making planes. They wasn't manufacturing, you know what I'm saying, furniture and clothes. They was making guns. Well, who was in them factories making them guns and them planes and them trucks and them trains? Black people, you understand? The generation that came up in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s told their children the importance of having an education. Because having an education and being smart made you worthy to the white, made you worth something to the white man. You understand? So the generation of the 60s and the 70s was, was, was intelligent black people. You understand? Them Black Panthers that came up, now while they loved white women and they was off, them brothers were smart. They knew the laws of America, knew what the, what they could and couldn't do, knew what their rights were. Everybody understand? The, um, um, uh, the, you know what I'm saying? The Black Panthers, you understand? Um, all of them, them, them groups that came out of the Civil Rights Movement was full of affluent, intelligent black people. The problem was there was no... The white man broke our our unity broke our resolve by dividing us over money you understand over there in california before the crips and the bloods was killing each other over crack they was community organization you understand uh, crips stand for community resistance and progress i forget what blood stand for but they was the community organization to protect community you know what bloods is Oh, what is it? Brotherly love overrides oppression and destruction. Brotherly love overrides oppression and destruction. I ain't know none of that. You Pyro? <laughs> <laughs> you understand? But the problem was they didn't have the truth. They didn't have the knowledge of the most high. You understand? They was not following the Bible. So the white man was able to infiltrate them, was able to destroy them. You understand? But to further stop the progress of that generation, the white man introduced the crack, introduced the weed push the heroin and the LSD. These drugs was the white man's way to stop our revolution. Everybody understand? Now, um, you understand? Our people, for a long time, we've looked at selling drugs. We've looked at smoking weed and as a way to just get along in life. But the end of that way is death, man. The end of the path of being involved with drugs, selling drugs, smoking drugs, is death. You understand? Oh, right. and too many of us have seen brothers that had potential to do amazing things in life. Sisters that was beautiful and glorious be destroyed by drugs. 
You understand? Now's the time we got to take our community back. We the one got to be the ones to usher in the generation that's going to be able to accomplish what the generations before us failed to do. Everybody understand? Uh, All right. Give me um. So like, let me get Exodus chapter twenty-two, verse eighteen. Now, back to the history. You understand? Of of the CIA studying the effects of crack cocaine. All right. It says as early as 1974, the U.S. government was monitoring the effects of a drug that was ravishing South America called basuco as a first stage byproduct in the refinement of coca leaves into powder. The smoking of basuco had the same pharmacological effects as smoking crack cocaine, meaning the same high you got off smoking crack. These brothers and sisters in South America was getting off of smoking basuco. All right. It says um, users of this drug were observed to a bat. Now, this is what they observed, meaning somebody is studying these people that's smoking this drug. Here's the side effects of basuco. And y'all tell me if it sounds like something you can relate to. It said the users of this drug were observed to abandon every aspect of a normal human life, meaning the things you would normally do, get up, go to work, take care of your kids. You know what I'm saying? Run some errands, pay your bills, wash your clothes, keep everything clean. The things that, that uh, they abandon every aspect of a normal human life, including eating, drinking, and personal hygiene to the point of defecating in clothes that would remain on, remain unchanged for days. And does that sound like anybody you know? You ever known somebody that just stopped living their life and their life became about one thing and one thing only? And it wasn't taking care of their family. It wasn't paying their bills. It wasn't going to work. Their life became about getting this drug. Who does that sound like? Mm. Zach, have you ever known anybody in your life that one day they live in life normal, doing what they're supposed to do. The next day, they just say to hell with that. And their life becomes about one thing only. They stop going to work, stop paying their bills, stop caring about their family, stop having love for their kids, for their parents. They'll rob, steal, and kill anybody for this one thing. Who does that sound like? Marat. Uh, like, like drug addicts. Sis. A crackhead. A crackhead, is still from, a crackhead is still from his mama. You understand? Anybody seen that movie? I believe it's Blue Hill Avenue or Sugar Hill with Wesley Snipes and the brother. Samuel L. Jackson was the brother, right? Or was it another cat? Samuel Jackson. What movie was that? Was it Sugar Hill or Blue Hill Avenue? Well, he's stealing his brother and his mother person, take everything she had. Oh, yeah. And one day the father was like, you come in here, get him ahead. The father hated him. Man, I forget. But that, that cat in that movie, it was Wesley Snipes and, and Samuel Jackson was his brother. But that movie, man, showed how cocaine destroyed our people. You understand? Crackhead just abandoned every way of normal life and would do anything to get high. And guess what? While crackheads was getting high and while drug dealers were selling crack and getting paid, guess what they weren't doing? They abandoned every normal way of life. You're thinking normal. What are you focusing on? Focusing on surviving, making a better way for yourself. Well, if you're busy, fight, busy smoking crack and trying to do whatever to get crack, what are you not busy doing? Like, um, like revolting. Fighting the white man. You're not busy fighting the white man. You understand? The white man studied the effects that crack cocaine had on people and knew that the people that smoked this drug, they abandoned all of their lively ambition. Their life became about one thing, and that was getting this drug. Everybody understand? Is a uh, reading on. It says, despite knowing what was going on in South America for half a decade, scientists, now, these are scientists. This is the National Institute of Health. This is the Center for Disease Control. These are your science, the American scientists came before Congress in 1979, had to have hearings about the dangers of cocaine use and gave a glowing, gave a glowing report about the drug and its medicinal benefits. Now, while they was condemning crack and talking about how evil and horrible it was and how it messed you up, they still were promoting the use of cocaine. Everybody understand? Talking about the medicinal. What are we here today? What are they pushing on everybody? The medicinal uses of marijuana, smoking weed, got medicinal purposes, and this and that. There's nothing, every herb, the Bible says the Lord made every herb good, right? Every green herb was good. The Lord made it for have its own purpose, but to smoke it is to sin against the Lord. 
To smoke it is to take on the customs of another nation in the worship of their gods. Everybody understand? You cannot smoke anything. Everybody understand? Now, marijuana has medicinal purposes. If you a cat that got muscular dystrophy, where you got weak muscles and back spasms and you can't control your body, well, guess what? You you eat some weed or drink some uh, marijuana tea, it'll help relax your muscles, relax your body. But guess what? If you ain't got muscular dystrophy, you don't need to be drinking weed tea. Weed tea is not for, you know, your headache because of how evil this world is. Everybody understand? The use is a, one of the side effects of marijuana, regardless of how you take it, is lethargy. You become lazy. You lose your inhibitions. You lose your drive. Lose your ambition. America came out with a report that said they lost world. They lost Vietnam because all of the soldiers was getting high on weed. Soldiers was getting high, having fun, having sex with every Cambodian they could get their hands on. And they was not busy fighting and doing the business of a soldier. You cannot be a soldier and running to weed. You understand? In any form. You can't be a soldier and run into, you know, codeine in any form. Everybody understand? Now, you got pneumonia and your lungs is about to give out. Get some codeine so you can clean your system and help your body get strengthened. Everybody understand? You got muscular dystrophy and the doctor, you understand, prescribe you marijuana, then find a way to get some tea and drink it. But if you a brother that doesn't have any bodily harm, bodily injury, then you got to fight the demon that tells you that you need weed. Everybody understand? You got to fight the demon that tells you that you need codeine. And the only way you're going to be able to get rid of those demons is in the ISUPK. Hold That's your point. Right. Hold your point. Um, so in 1979, they was given hearings talking about the dangers of crack cocaine. In the early 1980s, the established relationship between drugs and oppression took a calculated turn from bad to nightmarish. You understand? Now, these scientists were studying the Basuko drug, were studying the effects that it had. These same scientists are the ones that taught these black drug dealers how to cook up crack. You understand? You um, There's a movie that the cat Rick Ross did, a recent documentary, where he talked about how they were taught how to make crack. Crack was not something that black men just came up with on their own. It was something the white man tested and studied, and he passed it on to us to be a, as a way to further speed up the destruction of our people. Everybody understand? Get me um, Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. Now, the advent of adding water and baking soda to cocaine hydrochloride powder cooked over a stove created crack. What we today call a drug dealer is what biblically is known as a witch. We're going to show you in the Bible, all right? Exodus 22 and 18. Come on. Exodus go ahead. Chapter 22. 22, verse 18. 18. Speak. Don't, don't say that. Oh, sorry. Exodus. Oh, sorry. Let me get um Tazi, you when you read. The book of Exodus, chapter 22, verse 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Say it again. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Say it one more time. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Now, as we was growing up, what is the what is the mental picture you have of a of a witch? See them in cartoons and movies. What is a witch always doing? Yeah, uh, staring at uh, the, the big pot. She's standing over the big pot. She's stirring. She's throwing all types of things in there. Pig's foot, <laughs> rabbit's ear, you understand, worms, uh, 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 <laughs> you know what I'm saying, a giraffe toe. She throw it in the mixture. She's cooking it up, you understand? And what is she making while she's cooking that up? She's making something that's going to affect somebody. But that's what a drug dealer does in America today. Take that powder cocaine, baking soda, and gonna tell y'all the rest. And you mix it up in the pot, standing over the stove. Even the rappers talk about it. And I show you how evil, uh, so evil the white man is. And he's he's made that our our legacy. Fucking selling crack, cooking up dope, being a witch is the legacy that so many of our people hold on to. You understand? They got dances called the. All of that, the whipping and all of that, man, it's evil, man. You understand? It's advertising being a witch. The Lord said we should not let a witch live. You understand? A witch is a drug dealer. You cooking up crack, you selling crack, selling weed, growing weed and mixing all types of stuff in the water that you use to grow the weed, you a witch. And the Lord said you should be put to death. You want to know why drug dealers die every day a horrible death? Because they deserve it. Everybody understand? Oh, God. Come on with it. 
Show them off. What, sir? This is just off topic. I just, uh, I just wanted to know, like, like I was, uh, like the nation said they, the heathen nation said they, cool. like the name that they got. How, 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 and when did the names get changed from the biblical names into the name that they that they got today? I would, I deal with that after after this. All right. Um, huh. All right. So everybody understand. The Lord said, "Thou shall not let a witch live." Everybody understand. Girl, girl. So I'm gonna throw some, I'm gonna throw some, um, some figures at y'all. You understand? After what happened in South America, crack in the ghettos was worse. Everybody understand? While the bazooka use was limited to areas where the coca plant grew in South America, crack hit everywhere in North America. Hit everywhere in the Black and Hispanic community. From 1978 to 1984. Cocaine consumption in America increased from between night down in 1978. Americans was using about 19 to 25 tons of cocaine. I mean, and all the white boys that was getting rich and snorting cocaine, about 25 tons was coming into America in 1978. In six years, from 78 to 84, the cocaine went from 19 to 25 tons to 71 and 137 tons. You understand? Remember I said about the capitalist market? The supply goes up, the demand increases, and the person that controls the product controls the prices. Well, that's what happened with cocaine from 1978 to 84. If you own the poppy field, you own the co coca field in South America, you get amazingly rich. Now, who owned all the coca fields in South America? The white man owned all the coca fields. Who was the slave masters in South America? Who were the ones that owned land in South America? It was the white man. Everybody understand? The white man in South America, the Spaniards, the sons of Spaniards, grew the coca, had, you understand, Israelites pick it, had Israelites getting high off the bazooka, but they were selling megatons of cocaine into America and getting rich, getting paid on the stock exchange. Everybody understand? Cocaine is a commodity that's traded on the stock exchange. Now, you ain't going to see cocaine as a stock, but you will see so-and-so agricultural company, Columbia. What is the agriculture they move in? Cocaine. Everybody understand? From six years, from 78 to 84, they got black people on crack. It went from 25 tons to 137 tons. Everybody understand? Um, is it crack transformed once beautiful, thriving, affluent Negro communities overnight into zombie crack zones. You understand? From 84 to 89, homicide rates doubled for black males between the ages of 14 to 17, it went up 30%. You understand? So in 84, black males was dying at, at a, a high rate. But it went up 30% in the six years that crack cocaine came into our cities. For brothers between 18 and 24, it went up 10%. Everybody understand? The death rate shot up the roof. Along with the supply and demand of cocaine, the supply and demand for guns, and the and the, the the amount of deaths that we were seeing increase. Everybody understand. So crack not only destroyed the people that were smoking it, it destroyed the brothers that were selling it as well. Now, at the same time that crack cocaine was being brought to America, Ronald Reagan in 1986 signed the Anti Drug Abuse Act. Now, in the Anti Drug Abuse Act, let's go back to get the picture of him up. Oh man. Oh man, Ronald Reagan. You understand? 1986, the bill, the anti-drug, the anti-drug abuse act of 1986, created mandatory minimum penalties for drug offenses, which to this day are responsible for significant racial disparities in the prison population. With the passing of this anti-drug bill, that's when the war on drugs became a war on black people and Hispanic people. You understand? Back in 1986, the man that's vice president today, Joe Biden, he was Senator Joe Biden in 1986. Guess what Senator Joe Biden said? He said that we should make stiffer punishments for people that sell crack versus people that sell powder cocaine. What did Joe Biden know in 1986? That black people smoked crack and white people snorted powder cocaine. Guess what he suggested the ratio be? He suggested the ratio be 100 to 1, meaning you get caught with crack, the, you get 100 times the penalty as somebody that gets caught with powder cocaine. 
And that's when the war on drugs became a war against black people because they targeted you. Everybody today that's so loving the Democratic Party, they ain't never loved you. They've always been about your death, your murder, and your incarceration. Everybody understand? Joe Biden, the vice president today, is the reason why brothers was getting football numbers in 1986. He's the reason why all of our uncles and our cousins and our fathers got thrown in jail behind a half a gram of cocaine, or five grams of crack. The reason why a nigga did 10 years for uh, five grams of crack was because of Joe Biden. Everybody understand? Because of the U.S. government targeting our people, all right? Um, let me get um it's a lot. Let me get Nahum chapter three verse ten. Nahum chapter three verse ten. Nahum. No, it's a lot. It's, it's one scripture I'm missing. Give me Mark three and twenty seven. Mark three and twenty seven, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get up off of it. So the Iran Contra scandal. Is 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 the people finding out about the Iran Contra scandal is what led to everybody finding out about how the CIA and the Ronald Reagan administration flooded crack cocaine into the ghettos. Everybody understand? If it wasn't for the Cold War between America and Russia, we probably would have never had the civil rights movement. Probably because the civil rights movement now. What happened in Nicaragua with their civil war? That is what Russia was trying to do to America with the civil rights movement. Everybody know who supported the Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, right? Oh, Come on with it, um, Tazayawan. Uh, the, the, um, the Russians. The Russians, the communists. The communists wanted black people to revolt against the white man. Wanted America to have a civil war and implode on itself so that the communists could be a world power. You understand? And the communists tried to get black people to incite and raise up against the white man. And the white man's way of responding to that was to give you crack cocaine. Everybody understand? Oh, Down there in Nicaragua, them people wanted to get free and have their own government. The white man's response was to send in the sat, was to create the Contras and start a war. You understand? That's what's going on across this planet today. You see the white man, he went into Egypt and took their lead out and put somebody in. That's because he wanted to have somebody that was friendly to America. He went to Libya and killed Muammar Gaddafi and started a war and created ISIS. That's because he wanted the, Lib the country of Libya to be on America's side. They over there fighting in Syria now because the white man did not want the Soviets, the Russians, to have control in the Middle East. Everybody understand? Uh, World uh, War III that is being fought right now is because the Most High is trying to deliver us out of the hands of the white man. Everybody understand? And the white man is doing what he's always done, which is be the devil on the face of the earth. That's and that's right. why he's going to be destroyed for going into them countries and fighting all them wars. Everybody understand? Uh, Give God. me Mark chapter 3, verse 27. Mark chapter 3, verse 27. Read. No man can enter into the strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man. You understand? No man can enter into a strong man's house and take everything that belongs to that strong man unless he first binds up the strong man, makes the strong man weak, stops the strong man from fighting, stops the strong man from protecting his family. Well, guess what, black man? You are the strong man in this nation. You are the strong man in your house. You are the strong man for our community. And the white man bound us up with crack cocaine. He bound us up with weed, bound us up with, with mollies and oxycotton and all of this evil that is destroying the strength that exists in a black man. Everybody understand? The white man is behind it. Why? Because he wants to destroy your house. You know what else happened along with the, with the drug epi crack epidemic in the 80s? Welfare. Black women got on welfare like it was going out of style. You understand? All the black men going to jail and going to prison. You understand? And the white man was able to take over. The white man was able to infiltrate your house. The whole generation of us today was raised by our grandparents or raised by one parent because of crack. Right. A lot of us grew up without our fathers because the white man bound up our fathers. He bound up that strong man and destroyed our house. And Barakatha Yahweh Yahweh Shah for commanding General Yohana because that is a strong man 
that was right. not able to be bound up. That's right. Thank the most high for the ISUPK because at the time right. in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, while black men were being destroyed by crack, being destroyed by gangs, being destroyed by trying to join the white man, there were brothers that stood strong for the Lord. There were brothers that protected this house so that we today could be the men that's protecting the house now. Everybody understand? The white man is the devil the Bible speaks of. That's right. Ronald Reagan is an evil, diabolical devil. I pray he come back in the reincarnation and get the most heinous rulership. You understand? I don't know who's going to get the luck and draw on that one. But all the evil and horrible that happens to every white man, I'm going to think of Ronald Reagan. All the white women that we shave bald and, you understand, they be off footstools or whatever. I don't want white people in my house. Like, if I make it in the kitchen, right. I want to eat them in my house. So I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I might have white women be the pillars that hold my house up. You go, you see bricks <laughs> under the house, I just have white people up under there. Every time I have one of them, I think of Nancy Reagan. You understand? Nancy Reagan is the trap queen. Because her husband, Ronald Reagan, was the trap king. Everybody understand? Right. Let's not forget this evil bastard, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, though. Don't forget that during the, the Bush, Bush Sr. ran the CIA during the 70s. So while all that Basuko was destroying the people in South America, he knew about it. His operatives were telling him. During the Reagan administration, now, just to give y'all a little backdrop on Reagan. Ronald Reagan was an actor. He wasn't, he was dumb. He wasn't like a main figurehead that knew everything and was pushing everything forward. It really was Bush. It really was George Herbert Walker Bush and the CIA ran the country during the Reagan administration. And the goal of the CIA was to destroy the black community and it was to take over the Middle East, which is why during the Reagan administration, you had the wars between Iraq and Iran. During the Reagan administration, right after Reagan got out of office, and Bush came in, then you had them go and take over uh, Panama. Everybody know about, um. well, I don't know if y'all know about it, but we're going to get into Manuel Noriega. We're going to get into what happened down there at the Panama Canal. We're going to get into the, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War. We've seen what his son did over there in Iraq and Afghanistan after 9-11. All of the evil that is going on in the earth today has been facilitated by these devils. Everybody understand? All right. So that's it on that. That's the Iran-Contra scandal. The ties into the crack epidemic in America. Again, the white man's name is Gary Webb. If you want to check his book out, Dark Alliance, go online to the ISUPK blog. You understand? You want to search Death of a Trap Queen, talking about how Nancy Reagan and her husband, you know what I'm saying, brought in the crack epidemic in America, and it was planned to destroy our people. Everybody understand? Oh, God, oh, God. Now, we're going to turn the class over to questions. Marat, we got brothers and sisters online with questions. Kind of one kind. All right, let's get some questions. Let's get it. Oh, my, you got to take this. Plug the speaker back in over there so I can hear the people. And we're going to take some questions, all right? We're going to take some questions online. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna, uh, you got the Zoho chat, right? Kind of. Uh, Anybody I, type I, in? I can give you the ones off the Zoho chat. Right, I can have one of the brothers get some. Right, we'll take the Zoho chat questions first. Go ahead. Kind of one kind. All right, we got brother Calvin Brown. All right, Calvin Brown, what's his question? Okay, he said, like I said, I'm going to go back up. I started answering the question for him. Well, if not, if you answered it, don't worry about it. If there's something you could have answered, then I don't need that. <laughs> God, God. All right. Um, uh, anybody else? La ah, you want to get some questions off? Yeah, get, get, get the brothers that's on the blog talk. How many people? Let me know how many people you got first. Um, yeah. Sharma, the question you asked, right? You wanted to know when did the people stop going by their biblical names and start to become other nations after the languages get confounded. After the languages change, then the people you know, they get their own language. Like, and it's like with okay, it's like with every language, what you call yourself changes. Like in in Hebrew, Israel is Yasher Allah, but when we say we Yasher Allah. Does anybody else know what we're talking about? No. So the Russians, we call them Russia. But in their languages, the nobody know what the hell that is, but to them, it's Russian. The Chinese, we call them Chinese or Moab. To them, they the Xing Chong Chi. Nobody know what the hell that is, but to them, it means we Chinese. Every people calls themselves what they want to be called. So when they encounter other people who speak a different language, they tell those people, call me this. That's how the, that's how the names change, you understand? But, okay, if you go back far enough in history, the lands of the, the, the okay, 
Na what doesn't change is the name of people and the names of places. No matter what language you speak, America is America. If you ever watch, sometimes you ever watch like um a foreign movie or something. It will be like, let's say Spanish. You know what I'm saying? I don't like, I don't, because I make Spanish sound horrible. Because I don't speak it good. Let's do Chinese, right? <laughs> you might hear, Xing 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 John. Xing 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 Xing. The name John don't change. It's still Xing 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 until they say your name. John. So in other languages, you know what I'm saying? They speak the Xing 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 Xing. America, because America's name doesn't change. You understand? So name, if you go back far enough in history, in the parts of the world where our people were, you can still find names that relate back to what the Bible says. Like in the Middle East today, you still Babel, Babylon, Akkad, you know what I'm saying? The 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 um Akkadian civilization. You know what I'm saying? You got um you got uh oh man. In the Middle East, a lot of them cities and villages and towns in the Middle East still have Hebrew names. You understand? So you still got their names in what's name? Nah, Mariah, you can just put them on the phone. Right? Oh, you just put tap the brother directly in. You ain't got to screen the calls, just put them in. All right, and I'll take the calls, all right? So you understand? So throughout time, as languages started to develop and everybody was speaking their own language, people decided to tell other people to call us this. Call me that. Just like we call us Yashar Allah. But a white man got English and said Israel. But we don't call ourselves Israel, do we? Nah. Call ourselves y'all Charlotte. You feel what I'm saying? So that's how it changed. All right, the brother just hung up. <laughs> All right, well, what was next? Just put them put them in on the red and just tell me the area code. All right. Any other questions in the class? Sis? It's 574 area. 574 area code. You got a question? Make sure the speaker turned up. All right, okay. No, please, bro. I just was calling. No, I just was calling this business. Okay, no sweat, brother. We we'll, we we'll put you back on what's the name. Put put him back on the um in the class. Come on, y'all. Come on. Who's next? Well, you know when you so I know this is sort of off the topic, but when when you you talking about like you know B team and all that stuff, mm -hmm. you know it's just like it's it like um because I know B does a lot of stuff that people don't understand. He does share. Stuff too. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, then uh, cataracts. Yeah, stuff like yeah that. it works for that. Yeah, and then um, they got other T as well that does some sort of things just okay. like that. Yeah, but every every know. every T comes from herb. Ginseng T. What does ginseng do? Ginseng give you energy. You understand? Give you stamina. You understand? It boosts your alertness. Chamomile makes you sleepy, relaxes you. You get to calm down a little bit. Ginseng gives you you know potency. So like you. Yeah. You understand? You make babies with the ginseng. You give you that. Every herb has different effects. Weed makes you relax, makes you not give a damn, makes you lazy, makes you hungry, which is why marijuana, the herb marijuana, is for someone who suffers from a painful body condition. The weed will, the weed tea would make them relax, their muscles relax. It would have made them sick back and just, ah. Uh, you that eating, you got a disease that infects your stomach, that make you not want to eat, you can't swallow food. Drinking weed tea will make you feel like, hey, I'm hungry. Let me eat. When you're not drinking the tea, you can't eat because you throw up everything you don't want to eat. But you, you drink the, 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 the weed tea, it'll make you hungry again. Now, if you're not a cat that's suffering from some type of muscle problem where you get constant pain, if you ain't got no appetite and throw up every time you try to eat, then you don't need to use the herb marijuana. It Everybody understand? It does more than that. I know, but you don't have a reason to use it. Right. Nobody has a reason to use it. I, if they have a reason to use it, they get counsel and they'll get the Lord will say, okay, well, you got to get some, get the herb in you. But why, well, why isn't it like that with any other tea? Because every other tea doesn't get you high. <laughs> we get you high. That's another side effect. It gets you high. Just like codeine. Codeine, you got a cold, your headache, you feel like you're going to blow your brains out, stuffed up. I don't know if you ever had pneumonia. You can't breathe. Codeine will open up your lungs, make you be able to sleep and rest, and your body will get better. But you can't take codeine if you ain't got a lung problem. That's what weed falls in that same category. Everybody understand? All right, come on with it. You want another call? Or yeah, yeah, give it to me. Come on. 
If the doctor don't prescribe it, you can't deal with it. If a doctor don't give you the prescription, you can't deal with it. Even if you get the prescription, come get counsel. Everybody understand? Uh, it's Zion one. So I'll be sorry if I could. Uh, it, it, it's on, 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 you know, on the topic mm-hmm. we're talking about. It, okay, like you remember with like the, the whole Frank Lucas thing with the uh, uh, heroin? Yeah. And, and he was he was saying like how they were saying how he was bringing it, shipping it from Asia mm-hmm. through the through the caskets and mm-hmm. the, you know. So I, I was wondering what you thought about that. <laughs> okay. If you want to go down the rabbit hole, <laughs> so like, so like I gotta do this. It's the Morpheus moment. You take the red pill, you go to the rabbit hole. You take the blue pill, you go back to your regular life. Okay, everything has been the CIA and the white man doing. You wanna know what was really going? You wanna know why they really had a war in Vietnam? There was no strategic purpose to fight a war in Vietnam. But do you know what they manufacture in Vietnam? Lies, sir. Poppy, which is used to make heroin. You understand? America couldn't let Russia get all the heroin, so they had to fight the war in Vietnam so that they could keep the heroin coming to America to keep people getting high. Do you know? Okay, the same plant that makes heroin, don't you know it's in all of your Advil, all of your Tylenol? Pharmaceutical companies depend on all the herbs that come out of the Middle East and the East to make all their medicine. If they let all of those countries fall into the hands of Russia, America would have no profit from any of that. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you something that now. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I do some studying and some research. Everybody understand? Before the war in Afghanistan, right? The 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 ah, what was they called? What was the terrorist cats in Afghanistan? The Taliban. The Taliban. When the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, their goal was to stop the export of the poppy plant. They took the export from the poppy plant from 60% of their, like, okay, you got a country, right? You produce rice, you produce silk, you produce poppy, you produce oil, right? 60% of Afghanistan's exports was poppy before 9-11. The Taliban took over. They took the the exportation of poppy from 60% down to 15%, meaning they stopped selling poppy. Poppy is used for everything. Advil, Tylenol, heroin, LSD. The white man could not let Afghanistan not give them heroin, not give them poppy. When the war in Afghanistan occurred and America went in there and bombed Afghanistan, the very next year, the exportation of poppy went from 15% up to 80. The American government got into Afghanistan and started selling everybody heroin. Started letting heroin go loose across the planet. They drove up the demand. They increased the supply, drove up the demand. Everybody understand? Do some research. I know cats that was in the military. There was a brother that used to have, that's in the school, used to be in the school, that was over there. And he talked about how there was entire army units that was doing nothing but protecting farmers who had poppy fields. That's why America went over there in Afghanistan. They went over there to get all of the opium, all of the oil. Same thing happened in Vietnam. Frank Lucas was able to get all of that heroin out of, uh, and really it comes from opium. He was able to get all of that heroin out of Cambodia because America wanted all the heroin out of Cambodia so it could get in the ghetto and kill black people. You understand? That was the CIA. If you go back and watch American Gangster with Frank Lucas, the police department was taking the niggas dope and stepping on it. They was taking his dope and making it less potent so they could get some money out of the deal. Drugs is big business, man, across the planet. Always has been, always will be. The white man is the drug dealer. He's the first drug dealer. He is the great drug dealer. You want to know how the white man took over China in the 1870s? Go research the opium wars. The Chinese had, the China sits on an island, a giant ass island where there's two ways in. You come across the mountains or you come through the, through the, through the sea. China, was, China had blockaded themselves, separated themselves from all everybody. The only trade China did was giving people rice and silk and taking whatever they had. The white man forced the Chinese to open their borders by giving their leaders poppy, giving their leaders opium, 
Go research the opium wars. You'll research, you'll see opium dens that were in China that destroyed the Chinese people. Drugs is big business for the white man. It's how he infiltrates everybody. He gets you high, gets you to make your women whores, gets you to not care about nothing but feeling good, and he destroys you. Oh, God. You understand? The white man been just dealing drugs since forever. Every black man that's ever been a drug dealer on the planet learned it from a white man or from a heathen. They were selling drugs in Egypt. Go research. General Yohanna bring it out. In Egypt, they was getting high. They were smoking weed. All the things that we're doing today, nothing ain't changed. Doc. None of this is new. The same parts of the world that produced the heroin today, we was in them parts of the world thousands of years ago. Getting high ain't nothing new. Just like homosexuality ain't nothing new. Go back into the reincarnation breakdown we did a couple, a uh, few weeks ago. You understand? Okay. There's nothing new under the sun. Getting high ain't new. You understand? In the biblical times, all of these drugs were associated with the worship of other gods. You understand? You ever notice how weed got a certain smell to it? You ever notice how frankincense and myrrh got a certain smell to it? You ever put on, you ever be at somewhere, somebody be like, is that frankincense? And you be like, yeah. I'm like, how they know? You know what I'm saying? Because that right. smell is the Lord's smell. 2,000 years ago, you smell like frankincense and myrrh, niggas like, he worshiped the unknown God. He worshiped the God of Israel. Well, you smell like weed, everybody knew you worshiped Cali. You smell like cocaine, everybody knew you worshiped the God of cocaine. You know how crack got a horrible smell. It's a, it's a faint smell. You don't know crack, you ain't going to know it. But if you know crack, you're like, hey, see? crackhead smell. Crack got a smell. You know this cat is worshiping the God of crack. Oh. Tobacco, cigarettes got a certain smell. Black and mild smell different than cigarettes. Even though it's tobacco, all of it is associated with the worship of gods. You go back in ancient times and do the research, you'll find out. Everybody understand? Oh, wow. The white man is the, he is the, the great whore. You understand? He is mystery Babylon because everything evil that's ever existed on the earth, the white man has perfected it. Give me Nahum three or four. We got any other question? A lot of. Uh Brothers and sisters online, if you want to blog talk, you have a question or a comment, press number one so the brother will see. Now, you know how to identify the people that's we got questions, right? Should be a blue circle next to their phone number. Uh, uh, so nobody got blue circle or question mark next to their uh, number. Oh, question mark. Okay. Con, con, you, we got, I got a, we got a question right here. All right. Hit up. 773, Eric Cole. 773, Shalom. Right, you, wanna, you, you got a question? Seven seven three area code. No sweat. Come, so like it. The water captain was shot in Egypt. It was the lotus plant. In Egypt, they were smoking the lotus plant. Shalom, brother. Seven seven three. You got a comment or a question? Call drop. Yeah, man. What y'all scared, man? <laughs> <laughs> it's like nah, really. four one four. Four one four area code. You got a question? 414 area code. Okay. All right, Shalom, who is this? Officer Gamal Style, Wisconsin. Shalom, Mike, what's going on? All right, so I posted um, the, uh, the question on YouTube, but um, all right, since we were on the topic of different herbs having different properties and different uh, um, purposes, was there an affliction that made strong necessary? You mean alcohol? Kind of one kind. Let's get it. Let's get. That's a good question. Let's get it. Um, is that your is that your only question? Kind of one kind. All right. Uh, stand on the line. Give me one second. Um, give me Proverbs chapter three thirty one verse six. Proverbs 31, verse 6. It's like, you want me to read? Can you can read it up. Turn, uh, turn them up a little bit. Right, turn right. Right. The book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 6. To give strength. No, oh, come on. What happened, Ron? So, like, say it one more time, up. You still there, Gamon? Still there. 
He must have hit mute his phone. Unmute your phone, call. Unmute your phone. Come on. He's still, still on here. read? Yeah, he still is. So. All right, what has somebody else read? Somebody else read uh, Proverbs 31 and 6. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 6. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to purge. Give strong drink to him that is ready to perish. What does that mean? You ready to perish. What does that mean, sis? You ready to die. What circumstances? Under what circumstances is a man ready to die? Mariah. Uh, one is when you got to defend yourself and you know it's probably like in the spirit of warfare. Okay, how in the spirit of warfare though? You don't want to get drunk before you go battle. La, 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 la. <laughs> you, give, me, give, me, give me some things, that's situations that a man's ready to die. You know he's ready to die. Tell us how you want. Uh, se severe depression. Severe depression. Uh, Jeez, uh, the world is beating him down. It's... He at the end. He ready to end it all. Man, get that brother a drink. These homeless cats that be on the street, fought in the white man's military and came home and they tried to do all type of experiments and didn't give them their money they were supposed to get. They didn't give them their VA checks and doctor won't see him and help him with the nightmares he have him. Man, get that brother a drink, man. man get a drink and to get away from that, you know what I'm saying, depression. You understand? Everybody remember Biggie Small's Ready to Die album, right? Oh, you understand know all the stress and the str struggle and the, and the pain and frustration you deal with being a black man in America. And sometimes when you just need a drink, man, get that boy a drink. Give him some strong drink. You understand? Oh, so that he can deal with that, with what's going on in his mind. I don't forget his worries, man. Forget his stress and just make it to tomorrow. Now, he shouldn't do it every day. He shouldn't depend on that drink. But there's a time when Drink is what you need, man, to get through. There's another situation. Now, read on, Yonakon. And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. And wine to those that be of heavy hearts. Man, my main man died, man, passed away. Have a drink in that brother's name, in that brother's honor. Let's not be sad. You understand? He gone. He'll be back. Let's drink for that brother. You understand? Let's not drink up to him. There's times when you should drink, when you need to drink. Hey, I just got another rib. We popping bottles tonight. I'm trying to get another rib. We popping bottles tonight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's some reasons to get a drink. Everybody understand? Uh, give, give strong drinks to those that be heavy hearted. You understand? Give wine to those, you understand, that's going through it. There's a reason for the wine. Reason for the strong drink. Everybody understand? Uh, give me um 1 Timothy 5 and 23. There's another reason to drink strong drink. You understand? Drink wine. It has another effect on you under different circumstances. There's one, you drink because you man, you're going through it, brother sad, he's depressed, he's fighting it. You know what I'm saying? Struggling. Just have a drink, man, get to tomorrow. First Timothy 5. First Timothy 5 and 23. Okay. First Timothy is 5 and 23. First Timothy 5 and 23. Come. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Oh, Aki and Aki, I got it. Come. All right. No, 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 drink. No longer water. Don't drink water. There's a time when you don't drink no water, Aki. You good. You got enough water. You replenish. You hydrated. You good to go. Don't drink water. Read on. But use a little wine. Use a little wine. You ain't just drinking for the fun of it. You're just drinking for the purpose that wine was made for. Use a little wine. Read. For thy stomach's sake. For what? For thy stomach's sake. For what? For thy stomach's sake. You ever been nervous? You ever been about to go to camp and speak? <laughs> no. Your first speaking? Man, calm them nerves, man. Have some wine. Some strong. Take the edge off a little bit. You understand? For thy stomach's sake. So you can get the guts to do whatever it is you're about to do. You understand? I'm about to go ask this woman's father, can I marry her? Let me get some Manny Shevitz in me before I go in there. Let me take a right. shot of some Jack before I go in there, because this cat is mean and rough. He's a UPK father. Let me go drink before I go before this cat. You understand? I got to teach the class tonight. Let me settle my stomach, you understand, and get prepared to do the Lord's work. 
there's a reason to drink some wine. Use the wine. Everybody understand? Right. Read on. And thy often infirmities. And thine often infirmities. There's all types of things you're going to encounter being a man of the Lord. You understand? Fighting temptation. Satan trying to get you to send some, something horrible. You fight it. you like, man, the hell with that. I ain't going out tonight, man. I'm going to sit here with Jack tonight. I'm chilling with Jack and watch the boxing match. Watch the basketball game. You understand? Whatever your infirmity is, use the wine. Use the strong. Has a purpose. It's not just getting drunk. It ain't just, you know, partying and whatever the case may be. There's times when the drink is what you need. And the Lord made it for that purpose. Everybody understand? Oh, Hope that answered the brother's question. All right. Um. Now, on the, on the flip side of that, of course, you cannot overindulge in anything. Too much of anything will kill you. You drink, you know, too much water, your gut will explode. You understand? You you breathe too much air and don't exhale, you'll die. <laughs> don't drink too much, but drink enough to get through whatever it is that you're going through. Everybody understand? Oh, don't drink every day. Don't drink to the point where you. Stop to serve the Lord. You understand? That's where you become a glutton. You overindulge. If anything causes you to not serve the Lord, then you shouldn't do it. Everybody understand? There's drinking, and then there's drunk. There's, hey, I'm drinking, I'm chilling, I'm, I'm hanging out. Then there's, I'm drunk, my pants is at my ankles, and my rod is in everybody. Everybody see my rod. Don't be that cat. You understand? That is a sin. Don't drink to the point where you can't control yourself. There was a brother here in the Philly school that recently got kicked out because he just refused to get control of himself. Everybody understand? Learn from that. Don't be that cat. You understand? Now, that cat's still a brother. We love him. We pray to the Lord he come back. But until then, he can't drink if he's going to be in here. This is the place where you can get control of all the things that you have problems with. Everybody understand? Go to Christ. All right? Um, come on with it, Tizayon. Oh, sorry, sir. I, I had another question. Come on with it. It was in it's, it, Okay, in the book of Ezekiel, the, the eighth uh, chapter and the seventeenth verse, I was wondering if this was talking about um, if it was talking about weed. Ezekiel eight and seventeen. Come on, come on. And, Is it a uh, uh, don't say it. Is it a um, instant scripture? Uh, or is it the branch to the nose? Come on, come on. Branch to the nose is definitely talking about weed. Definitely talking about cocaine. All that. What do we call weed? Slang for weed today. Mariah. Call it tree. Tree. What's the first thing you do before you, Mrs. Lockie? We new men. Somebody that smokes weed. What is the first thing they do before they buy it? Smell it, sir. Put the branch to their nose. You put the tree to their nose. Nah, man, this ain't good. Or, damn. <laughs> That's the branch to the nose. You understand? Uh, Come on I, with it. I thought, I thought it was like, um, but I thought it was like, uh, when, when I was reading it, I, I like, you know how like they, they roll it up in like backwoods? Cause that's like, like same thing. Tree, you know same, I mean? same thing. Let's read, let's read the scripture. Uh, Ezekiel chapter eight, verse 17. Come on, come on. The book of Ezekiel chapter, chapter eight, verse 17. Then he said unto me, hast thou seen this? O son of man. Lord said, have you seen this? O son of man. Have you seen what the children of Israel are doing? This is the prophet he's talking to. He's talking to Ezekiel. Have you seen what they're doing? You seen what's going on, Bree? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? Do the house of Judah think that this, this, this is light? They think that this shit don't matter? They think that it's okay they're doing this evil they're doing. They're doing these abominations and they don't even mind this shit. It ain't like something they hiding, something they doing undercover and they being sneaky about it. They in the public doing this. They think it's a small thing. Read on. For they have filled the land with violence. They filled the land with violence. They forming gangs and shooting each other over colors and blocks that don't belong to them. You understand? They partying, throwing up, they setting, beefing and fighting. You understand? They fill the land with violence and all the different ways that you cause violence to happen. Read on. Come on, God, and have returned to, to provoke me to anger. And then they, they went back to making me mad. They went back to making me angry. They went back to doing things to disrespect me. This is the Lord talking. Read on. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Man, look here. They, they put the branch to their nose. They know putting the branch to their nose is evil. They know how much I hate them putting the branch to their nose, but they put the branch to their nose. Oh, you understand? Smell good. Right, now. 
putting the branch that they knows is also why the land is filled with violence. Oh, it's God. also why they prov they provoking the most high to anger. You understand? Oh, the God. putting the branch that they knows is causing all the it, it, it's trip is it's spilling over into all the rest of the evil that's going on. Oh, God. And that applies to Israel today. That weed is a big reason for all of the, a lot of the evil that's going on. You get high, that hole look good. I know she's so and so woman from down the block around the way, but man, she looked good. I'm feeling good. You understand? I, I I've been smoking, so the game that come out my mouth is the magnificentest pimping on the planet. So I'm gonna get it. It spills into everything. Even you understand? Oh People think that that getting high is not a big deal. It's major to the Lord. Right. It's everything. You understand? Oh my God. So you, you good? Go oh, side. In Christ. Yeah, if, if I could. Um, so what what like when you say like Sydney real quick. God, God, sir. Come on with it. Uh, would it be like when you say putting a branch to your nose, would it be like still smoking it and like you know still smoking it as well? It still like smoking it as well, inhaling it, blowing the weed out your mouth and you know, whatever they do with it, still it, it's it's you know what I'm saying? But yeah, but when you a lot of times with the scriptures, when you break them down, you want to paint a picture for people, make them see it visually, give them something they can relate to. When you read putting the branch to your nose, people like they think you're taking a tree, a branch, and then putting it to your nose. You got to make them understand. Man, what do we call weed today? We call it tree. Trees have branches, right? But what a drug dealer do that's trying to sell you some weed? Hey, smell this, man. And what do you do? Put it to your nose. Oh my God. Oh, that smell good. Oh, that's that bush. You understand? But you put it to your nose. Putting the branch to your nose leads to you smoking and sinning against the Lord. That's now you gotta remember too, the Bible is written by black people that talk in slang. That's that's our fathers talking to us about smoking weed. You niggas put the branch to your nose. You niggas is evil. You understand? All right. Slack it, sir. Come on. We got a question. Uh, numbers twenty one and seven. Numbers twenty one and seven. Exodus twenty one and seven. Exodus twenty one and seven. Let's get it. Who is the uh, brother asking the question? Trooper Thawra Rod. Trooper Thawra Rod. Is that California? Nashville. No, Nashville. Nashville. New Trooper. Shalom, my most high Christ. What's the question? Numbers twenty one and seven. Yeah, you can't even get a breakdown. Josiah. No, matter of fact, Mariah, you get numbers twenty one and seven for me. Kind of work out. All right. Okay, so I need to know. I mean, Exodus 21 and 7. Oh, man. Okay, Exodus 21 and 7. All right, go on to the serpent breakdown, but let's get Exodus 21 and 7. Exodus chapter 21, verse 7. Okay, hold up. Uh, I need you to give me a little bit more on this, Star Wars. I can break it down for just verse 7. But I might need to go down to um, take verse 8 as well. All right, we're going to read 28, 21, and 7 while you uh, type back in what's the point of your question. Come on with it. Exodus chapter 21, verse 7. If a man sell his daughter to a maidservant. If a man sell his daughter to a maidservant, or as a maidservant. Now, oh, to be a maidservant. To be, under what circumstances would that happen? I got a daughter, right? And I'm going to sell my daughter to be a servant. She's going to be a... Exodus 21 and 7. I got a daughter, and there's a cat who has a farm. I'm going to sell him. I'm going to give him my daughter to farm for him. You understand? I'm going to give my daughter to him to do work around his farm. Why would I be doing that? Under what circumstances would I do that? Kind of, kind of, if you... Uh... I guess if you needed the money. So. I owe this cat money. Kind of I need kind of. the money. I'm in debt. Baby girl, you at age now. You can do some work. I need you to help your daddy out. I'm going, you're going to go over Mr. Johnson and work during the day. Right? Oh, God. Now, when I give my daughter. Now, I'm not, I'm not selling my daughter to be Mr. Johnson's wife or his sex slave. I'm letting my daughter work for Mr. Johnson. You understand? This is not talking about. Um, let's read it on. So, like, let's read it on so we can understand. Go ahead. Keep read, Mara. Kind of, kind. He said he typed back in. 
He said, I wanted it broken down to 10, but I just didn't understand what, what I was reading. So he really. All right, okay, so let's get it. Kind of a So, verse 7 says, If a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go out as the maid serv as the men servants do. I Meaning, my daughter, I'm selling my daughter to this man to work for him, but he cannot let her do. She cannot put her in the same office as the men servants. So I sell my daughter to this man. He can't have her out there plowing the field with the, with the with the bulls. That's a man's job. He can't have her, you know, building houses. That's a man's job. I sell my daughter to be a maid servant. Man, he gotta make her do some woman duty. Let her wash some clothes or milk a cow or you know clean the clean the house. She got to do a job for a man and a job for a woman. Listen, like I know I owe you this bread. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you my daughter as payment for this debt. You can't let my daughter be disrespected, treated like you can't put her in manual labor. You can't have her breaking her back doing man work. Everybody understand? Oh, and when you God. sell your daughter to a brother. Because you in debt, because you need the money, that brother has the has the respect you enough to not have your daughter doing the man's job. Read oh on. Verse eight: If she please not her master, who have betrothed her to himself. Now, let's say you give your daughter to this man to work for him, and he decides, Shawty, I want to make you my wife. She working around the house, cleaning, cooking, or doing whatever he got her doing. He started to take a liking to it. Man, she's beautiful, man. He say to himself, man, I want to marry her. So he betrothed her to himself, meaning he tells her, you're going to be my woman. You understand? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make you my woman. He spitting to her, trying to get her to see how it would be beneficial to not just clean and cook around here, but get some of this raw, too. You understand? He trying to he doing what a pimp, I mean, pimp. He doing what a player do. He's yeah, baby girl. You know, you know what I'm saying? So you over here working all the time. You might as well go ahead and get that. He's talking nice to her, sweet to her. He trying to betroth her. He's trying to get her to agree to marry him. Read on. Kind of kind. Who had betrothed her to himself? Then shall he let her be redeemed. Now, if she doesn't please him. Or if she does, if he doesn't like the work that she does, or he doesn't like the way that she operates, she can redeem him back to her father. She can, he can give her back. He ain't had sex with her. He ain't made her his wife. She works for him. He trying to get with if if she doesn't, if her work isn't pleasing to him, he can redeem her. He can set her free. Man, go back to your father's house. Man, I'm good, Charlie. You go ahead and go. Everybody understand? Read on. To sell her to a strange nation, he, he shall have no power. Now, what he cannot do is sell her to heathens. He cannot sell her to a traveling pack of Arabs who carry in slaves and say, hey, man, I got this broad and all, and it's this maid servant that I don't want to deal with. Y'all take it. Give me 50 shekels of silver. He can't do that. He cannot get rid of this woman. Everybody understand? She is a daughter of Zion that her father sold her to him to, to satisfy a debt. He can't just throw her to the heathens. He can't just treat her like she trash. Everybody understand? This is a law the Lord gave us to make sure that we respected even the poor among us. Brother got to work for you to, to pay a debt. He got to sell his child to you to be a servant. You can't disrespect this child and treat this child like they nothing because they a day of your nation. They Israel. You understand? Read on. Kind of a kind. See. He have dealt deceitfully with her. He read on. And verse nine. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. You understand? So if he betrothed her to himself, he can't just be like, well, you know what? I'm calling it off. I'm gonna go ahead and just sell you. You can't do that to another nation. If he betrothed her to his son, he got to deal with her like a daughter. Which means what? I'm 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 a farm owner, right? And I got people that's under me, indebted to me. And from time to time, they sell they, they sell their daughter, their son to me. I can't take your daughter and let my son rape her. I can't take my daughter and, you know, force her on my son. I got to go to her and say, well, listen, baby girl, you know, you're going to be working here for the next 20 years. You know what I mean? John, John, he about to be 14, and he, he, could, he could use a woman like you to be his wife. What you think about getting with my son? She like, well, you know. I get with him, and then I make the deal like, okay, well, John, John, get right, he gonna become your husband. When he become right, and I, I say something happens, 
And I and I mean, I ain't, let's say something. I can't just say John John going to be your man and that's it. I got to deal with her like a daughter. I got to let her, you know what I'm saying? Treat her like my daughter and not just be a brute about it. Not just be a monster about it. I can't just one day come in there and say, tomorrow you're going to make John John a man. I got to deal with her honorably and righteously. Everybody understand? There was no circumstances in Israel where you could rape a woman or force a woman to have sex with someone against their will that was an Israelite. There were systems in place to make sure that every Israelite was treated with respect and honor and 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 treated like royalty. Everybody understand? Even if you was poor and broken and had to sell your daughter to me, I couldn't just, you know, run a train on her with my son and then sell her away. I had to deal with her right and honestly and be a man about everything. That's how we should be today. Y'all brothers encountering these sisters, whether it's in the world or online, you understand? Don't be a Tahar about it, man. Don't just run up in the broad and you know, lead the draws wet and roll out. Don't do that, man. It's evil, man. These broads, these sisters, even though they lost and they destroyed and they seeking attention, they need a real man. You understand? I said it before. You understand? If she don't save her, if she don't want to be saved, there's a million broads that do not want saving. But the ones that want saving, if she choose you, because they choosing, whether y'all realize it or not, these women are choosing. If they choose you, then save them. Be what the Lord called you to be and deal with her, her arguing and wanting to fight and attitude and being proud and not wanting to share you. Deal with it and treat that woman with, with, with the honor and respect that a daughter of Zion deserves. Check her when she needs to be checked, but make sure that she get the love she needs because she chose you. Everybody understand? Be a man about it. You understand? Do it right. There's a right way to do it. You don't know. Come get some counsel. We'll teach you. Everybody understand? Read on. Verse 10, if he take him another wife. Now, this is a man that already has a wife, right? God, God. If he take him another wife, read on. Now, hold up. This is the law now. If a man couldn't have another wife, it would say you can't take another wife. This is if you take another wife, which means what's already known. You can take another wife. God, so if God. you do decide to take another wife, read on. Her food. Her raiment and her duty of marriage. What is a woman's duty of marriage? Marah. Uh, the do benevolence. The do benevolence. You know. The duty of marriage is to continuously nourish the marriage. This, the Bible dictionary says that marriage is consummated and continuously nourished through sexual intercourse. Right. You want to keep a woman happy? I'm going to tell you, y'all, uh, let you in on a little secret. You got a woman that want to argue and fight all the time. What she's really yeah. saying is ravish me. Yeah. She's really, she arguing about the toilet seat or, you know, your funky drawers you left in the living room. What she really wants is for you to be a man about it. Don't argue with her. Just give her what she needs. Give her the duty of marriage. Now, you got a wife, you go get a new wife. Don't neglect the one that's been with you for 20 years because you got this new thing. She still got to get it too. Make sure she get what she deserves, because she deserves it. You understand? Right. Man, if you ain't got enough energy for both of them, you I don't know if you're Israel. But <laughs> if you ain't got enough energy for both of them, go to the gym. Go work yeah. out, do some push-ups and sit-ups. Get your wind up. Drink some ginseng. You'll be, you'll be okay. And she'll love you for it. They'll love you for it. Everybody understand? But you cannot neglect your woman because you got another woman. Yeah. And cats in the world make the mistake all but they in the world, so they don't know. But a cat in the world got a woman that love him and down for him. He go out and be tricking, you know, doing what he do with some other woman. He got a, a new woman, and he neglect the woman at home. You cannot go out and be gone all day and all night and come home and take a shower and get in the bed because she's waiting up the whole time you out. So when you come out, you got to let her know the whole time I've been out, I've been thinking about you. Everybody understand? That's how you keep a woman happy, keep a marriage right. The Lord made sure. The Lord put it in the law. Listen, man, you get another wife, I don't care. Make sure that this woman still get what's deserved, what she deserves. Everybody understand? Make sure she don't reduce from anything. Give her the food, the food she used to, clothes she used to. Make sure she get it and it's done. Everybody understand? Any other questions? I S U P K. You done heard a thousand times before that there's no history of the Israelites ever being in Egypt, right? 
What if I told you that I found the city of the Hebrews in Egypt, hidden in plain sight? And I'm going to bring it out at the Passover. This Passover 2016. I'm going to drop today.